Okay, now that you saw how the boot procedure works, let's look at some commands. I won't cover the grub because we have a one specific chapter for grub later and we will discuss there. So we'll start from the kernel as soon as kernel gets control. One good thing about Linux systems is they generate lots and lots of logs. When something happens, bad happens on a Windows system, you don't have enough logs to troubleshoot what is going on. That's the major problem. You can just install, reinstall, reconfigure, delete the configurations. But on Linux, you have lots and lots and lots of configurations which shows you what is going on on your system. During the boot up, kernel shows you line by line what is happening. As soon as kernel gets the control, whatever it does, it will tell you what I did, it was successful or not. And you can have a look at this. In desktop computers, many distros try to hide this information behind the splash screen. They will show you a cool, fancy graphical uh, picture instead of showing these lines. Although I think this was much, much, much cooler to be shown. Let me show you. On this Fedora, if I restart the machine, I will go here. I will go to the restart. Okay. And I'm restarting it. Most of the times, if you press escape, see, this is grub. Now it's loading the kernel. Now I push escape and it will hide the splash screen and show me what is going on. But you have to look like this and it is gone. You cannot troubleshoot what you should do. Fun fact. At this stage, kernel is loaded, as you remember, firmware bootloader kernel. But kernel is booting up. It doesn't have access to write logs in a file even. So what it does? That's because we have one thing which is called kernel ring buffer. It's a ring buffer, ring, which you write all the logs here, whatever happened, and just remember them inside the kernel. It's in the kernel's memory. So you have a command, which is the message. If you go to the console and run the D message, you will see whatever kernel has its in ring buffer. This is used because you don't even have access to the disks yet. Maybe not even yet. Maybe you have a problem and you are trying to boot the kernel and it crashes before being able to write to the disk. So you should be able to see something. So if I go up, which shift page up, you will see from the beginning what kernel has done. This is the time and it's in the second. So zero second, zero, 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 zero. Linux version, blah, 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 started. Command line was boot image was this. VM Linux is my kernel's address and it is using RHGB quiet. This, these are the parameters I'm sending to the kernel during the boot via grub. Quiet means don't show text, just show the splash screen. Ugly. Then it found these FPUs. These are information about BIOS it sees. Hypervisor detected. I'm on a virtual machine. This is my clock and everything else that you can check one by one. ACPI, how ACPI should work. Uh, power management, hypernation, how should work, what CPUs I'm seeing, all the information it sees after each time. After, for example, you can see uh, 0 0.06 seconds, it is doing something with its clock source. And everything is green, so everything is okay, it's working fine. And at the end, after, for example, five seconds, after nine seconds, it is connected to network. On 15 seconds, ISO something, Microsoft Juliet level, I don't know what is it, working loop. Very few people can understand all this line. Maybe nobody can understand all of this. Proxy window, blah, blah, 
started blah blah whatever happens you will see all the logs here and you remember this was the d message command which shows kernel being rough buffer data on linux systems we'll see later you can pipe everything to less and you will see it page by page which is easier page down will go down page up will go up q will go out we'll close this okay this was one way in some systems you may have different logs d message is always there as a command sometimes it's written to var log d message so you can check it on the system also you have things like var boot var log boot log this will show you all the boots sudo su is always good to give us the all the permissions i can do less show me page by page var log boot log it is boot dot log in red hat based systems on debian based systems it is only boot it says it's binary do you want to see it yes i'm sure this is not binary it has some characters like this to make it colorful so this okay will be in green and it says show plymouth boot screen plymouth directory watch and other logs about the boot if i catch them it would be nicer because those vo uh, those colors will work you remember with less i can see one file page by page with cat i will just type it var log boot log this is it and it says okay i'm doing this i'm doing that i'm doing this i'm doing that and it will show all the data during the boot this way you can troubleshoot your boot process or see how your system boots what we covered was the concept of kernel ring buffer, the D message as a command, and you can have different logs. Some systems do have this, some systems don't, and you saw these two. It is, became an arrow automatically, and I was taking advantage of it. But you also have one tool, which is journal CTL. It's like a systems journal. It will show you all the logs. I will cover it a little, a few minutes later. But if you go with a K switch in Linux, we do a dash and then we give it a switch. I say, I want to see kernel logs. And it will tell you, this is Linux version, blah, blah. Command boots, as you can see, it's exactly like the D message with some more data. Or I can say, just show me the boot process. It will show you whatever happened for during the boot. These are essentially the same at the moment, but later the kernel buffering can have more data. I saw something red. DRM, VM host printf, error, failed to send host log message. Not very important. But if you have an error here, you can see it here. The, also, the message does contain information about other devices. If you connected the USB and to a D message, you will see it connected here. If you do some stuff with kernel logs, you will see them here. That's another way to understand if your kernel recognizes this device or not. In general, if you go to the var log, all logs are here. If you do a ls, it's very common to do a ltr edge. Show me the uh, latest file on, at the end. So I will see them at the end. Also show the long format. You will see you have some other logs here too, like messages. You can do a chat messages and see all the messages are different components are sending to each other. I cat them. I cat the file so it's showing all the lines. These are the methods you can see what your system is doing during the boot. As you saw, the message. Maybe you should have this file, maybe not. Sometimes you have a file which is called system, depends on your distro. But journal K, journal dash B, and var log boot log on Red Hat based, and var log boot on the Debian based. And as you saw, I also have var log messages. And this way I can see what is going on in the kernel's logs or my boot logs. This was one part. But as I told you, Firmware to bootloader, bootloader went to kernel. Kernel 
starts the init process. Init process is responsible to initialize other processes which are needed. If you are running a web server, your web server program should be started when the system goes up. Most systems do have an NTP service, network time protocol. Set the time based on the internet clock or have SSH so you can, you can connect to the systems from far, far away or have a graphical interface, for example. Init program takes care of this. We are not putting this into the kernel to make it more stable, less complicated and separation of the tasks. Init systems historically was part of the Unix tool. So on the Unix system 5, there was an init system which a programmer created a kind of a copy, same logic, which is called system 5 init. Don't read it system V, it's system 5. System 5 was the de facto init system on many, many, many Linux distros for years, maybe decades. And nowadays it is not present anymore much. The reason is obvious, just like BIOS. It was old, it doesn't have some capabilities. For example, System 5 or System V, System 5, was not able to run two systems, two to start two services simultaneously at the same time. They would start one by one and this would make things slow. Or it was not very good at handling hierarchies. I need this in case of that. You had to program all of them manually, which was a headache. So different distros, companies, people started writing a more modern init system for the Linux. So Upstart was one of the promising ones. Started in Canonical, which supports Ubuntu, on 2014 and stopped at 2015. That's why you should have not an even an understanding. What does it say? Awareness of Upstart. But nowadays, most systems use uh, System D, which is a next solution after system 5 system d used to be hated but many but by many linux lovers because it's uh not neglecting but purposely neglecting some of the principles of unix designed systems for example in the unix systems including linux we want all our logs to be normal text files, which I can read by whatever system I want or parse or whatever. Or for example, each tool should do only one thing and do that very good. You should not do everything by yourself. System D is not respecting these ideas. But nowadays, that's the best thing we have and it's working fine enough. So nowadays, System D is what present in most of the or all of the major distros. If you want to check your init system, you, should, you can do which init or use the uh, ps-p1. If I say which init, you can do which any command you want and it says which is this command. It says your init is here. This doesn't give me enough info. So I will do read link, show me what is this link with f. If this is linked to some other link to some other link, just go and find the last one. User, oh sorry, user spin init. And it says, okay, your init system is user spin init. And that file is a link to user lib systemd, systemd. So I'm using systemd. I could do the same thing with checking the program with the PID1. As I told you, kernel comes up and the first thing it does is starts in it as the first process every process do have a name if you remember from the previous section on the proc you were able to see all of them so i will say give me the information about the process with process id one it says okay process id one is called systemd so i'm running systemd 
shame on me. No, it's good enough. And we have a fun command, which is PS3, which shows which process it shows process three. As you know, I can pipe it to less and see it page by page. So the first process is systemd. Systemd runs modem manager, network manager, vbox, uh, blah, blah, Avahi, crond, cops, and every other service I have. Also sshd, systemd, stpam, and lots of other things. As you can see in my tree, the root is systemd. So systemd is running everything else. To exit the less, I will push Q. I will press Q. But let's have a better look at systemd and then have a very, very, very short look at the system 5. Systemd works based on the units. Unit is a concept that systemd has, which lets you to create different things. Your units are defined here, etc, systemd, system. I will go to systemd, system. Here you can see different units. There are other units also in other places, but let's go one by one. Just wanted to show you that all of these are normal text files. Yeah, let's copy also the colors. It says this is the configuration, this is the description, this does the system reboot, this is the documentation, runs after this, I will have a better look here. But just wanted to show you that these are the some files which are located in these locations. Uh, to the priority. Priority 1, 2, 3. ETC, systemd system, run systemd system, and most of the things are here. Run, lib, systemd system. I have 12 different types. Auto mount, devices, mount points, where can I mount disks, path, scope, services, which is very important for us, slide, snapshot, socket, swap, targets also is important. You should now have an understanding of the services and targets and also timers you can say based on this timer rerun this service let's have a look don't panic systemd is complicated many linux people don't like systemd because they say this is complicated this shouldn't do this much this shouldn't be this complicated in different areas control everything this is not good and in LPIC, you don't need to have a very deep understanding of the system. I'm showing you more than what is enough. But the reason is, as a system admin, you should be able to work with systemd. Systemd uses two major commands. One is systemctl, another is journalctl. Systemctl, uh, what I have here, list units. List units. This will show you all the units, 12 kinds of units it has. Auto mounts, devices, and as you can see, it separates them with a line. This is another thing which a normal Linux person don't like. Devices, then mounts, like disks and other stuffs, then some paths, some scopes, and important parts are services. Services are the program or demons are the program which are running behind the scenes and answer back to the request or does something. For example, NTP is a service which can be run by systemd and it always keep your time accurate with the internet clock. Or SSHD is another service which lets your other people or you to connect to your computer from remote using a SSH command. And these SSHD, I mean. D is for daemon or service running behind the scenes. And these are the services I have in this computer. For example, COPS is for printers. SSH is for remote connections. I will go down. And as you can see, I just ran the 
system CTL list unit, but it's using the less pager, another thing that Linux people don't want. If you want to prevent it from doing so, you have to do the no pager and it will just show you. And there are some targets. Targets are the combination of the services and configurations. I can say, okay, SSH lets me connect from the remote. SSDM in this system lets me to log in in the graphical mode. Xorg is the graphical mode. Multi-user, sorry, uh, COPS is my print services. And then say I have a target which is called graphical target. It means I have SSDM which I can log into the graphics and I have this. I have another which is for example, I don't know, remote which lets me to have remote file systems and SSH, but not these. And you can switch between these. We will cover this a little bit later in the next section, next lesson, not in this video. So I showed you the list units. You can say list unit only of one type. So I will say systemctl list units type is service i only want to see the services so okay your network manager is a service i can say is it running systemctl status network ah status is not correct manager it says yes it is loaded and it is active or running and these are the logs related to it to run it i'm running this see it is cool kind of so i can list unit list unit for one specific target i can get default we'll show you the default target so system ctl get default it shows you graphical is your default car target what is graphical i can say system ctl chat graphical target see i push tab and it completes it says okay your graphical target is this it's a file on the system here user lib system the system graphical target its description is graphical interface documentation you can check here requires so if this is going to run you should have at least this target running so it runs this target and it wants this display manager so run this beforehand conflicts with rescue after multi-user rescue rescue target display manager if these are not running i cannot go to this state of graphical target and allow isolate yes you can have after before and other stuff to configure the hierarchies not you don't need to know the exact combination of all of them although if you want it's easy to search and learn about them so you can list the unit files even journal ctl list unit files ah why journal ctl system ctl list unit files and it will show you all the unit files it has this is the current state this is the vendor preset so for example if i go to the cops which was the graphical interface it says okay i want to go to the cops service it says at the moment it is disabled so it's not running and it is configured not to run in the beginning sometimes it's enabled sometimes it's static it's important to know disabled enabled and static static means it will be run if it's needed by others uh, for example if i say system ctl status sshd is ssh running it says yes ssh is running i can say system ctl system ctl stop sshd it will Ah, sshd it will stop the sshd if i check the status now it is inactive as you can see here i can start it again 
and now it is running. I can also enable and disable it. If I enable it, if I disable it, it means when the system comes up, when the system boots, this won't be running. This is disabled. So if I reboot the system, SSHD is not running. I need to start it manually. Otherwise, I can do a enable. Now it is enabled. So when the system boots up, this will be running automatically. These are how you interact with the services, especially. You can stop, start status. You can try is active. I can say systemctl is active sshd it says yes it is active so it's running uh, you can restart which does a stop and start you can reload or you can daemon reload if you reload a service it reloads the configurations of that service for example if i have sshd and i change the configurations of sshd i need to reload that service for example, I say people can log in anonymously. I will reload the service and now people can log in anonymously. That's the configuration of the SSHD itself. But as you saw, SSHD is a file on my file system which systemd handles. So if I change that file and say SSHD should be run after multi-user is started, so I'm changing the configurations of the systemd for SSHD. In that case, I have to do a daemon reload. And I can disable and enable. There is one fun thing, which is systemctl. Is system running? It checks if the system is running. Systemctl is system running. I push tab and it auto-completes. This is very, very good habit to start if you are not doing it. Because it saves you times first. And also it shows you if you are typing correctly, if the file is there. And so when it's possible, run it. Systemctl, is system running? Says, yes, yeah, system is running. It's not idiotic. There is a site which says, is my computer on? www, is my computer on fire? Okay, I went here. No, I wanted to go to, is my computer on? Ah, the site is not there anymore. It used to be there. Okay, no problem. Is my computer on fire on? It says no. Hmm, if your computer was on fire, go check this. <laughs> it's a joke, but this is not a joke. Because systemctl is system running. When it says running, it means systemctl. Services, targets, everything is running as configured. You can have other values there. You can have degraded. Degraded means some of your services which was configured to be running are not running. You can be in maintenance mode, initializing, starting, or stopping. So your scripts may check this. And if you were degraded, you can check with systemctl dash dash failed to see what service failed. This was more than enough, but it's good to know. And always you will see system admins having problem with system CTLs and what, with what you know. At the moment, you know more than 50% of the active uh, system admins. It's new and few of us dedicated some time to learn about them. Even more importantly, you should know how to work with journal CTL. As you saw, journal CTL is a systems journal. It keeps whatever happens there from the system boot. It says, kernel said Linux version is blah, blah. This is like a D message. I will go to page down, page down, page down, page down. Another reason that we Linux admins don't like system D because it does less by default. I will go page down, page down, page down, page down, and so you can see what is going on my system. Different modules. Up to now, system was booting, and all the messages were, I'm going up. Where? From the kernel. Kernel, kernel, kernel. But the system is up, and now audit module is saying something. Systemd itself says, finished this service. I started virtual console 
service audit draw cut command line saying this you have all the journals of whatever happened in your system Q to exit that as I said if you want to prevent system from doing the automatic less pager you can go with journal CTL no pager maybe I did I say it Don't know. anyway now it is showing everything just goes and goes and goes till it shows everything this is too large and it's not a good thing to do so we have one shortcut which is xe xe will show you fewer lines i think 100 lines and we'll go to the end of the bottom of the pager so now these are the things which happened and i can go page up page up to see the other parts if you want to exit less you should push or press q if you want to the, go to the end of the pager, you should push capital G, which is shift G will go to the end. I pushed Q and came out. You can say dash N 10 only show me 10 lines. You can say this is cool. Dash S dash 1D. So you can say journal CTL. I want to give you time. This will show you only one day. I will want only one minute. Ah, I think this is one month. Can I see one minute? I don't know. No. Okay, let's see one hour. Now, this is only for one hour, last hour. Anyway, and you can have dash UNTP to check only one specific unit, and you can have dash PID. So you will see logs from what specific and only one process ID. These are very useful. Even JournalD can export its data in JSON format, other format, so programmatic, programmatically, you can read them and parse them. So these are the advantages of the JournalD. And I think that's all. Something which we always use is dash XE, shows the latest and goes to the bottom. So if you're starting a service and you see an error, XE is your friend or dash F, which shows you the additions to the journal. And let's have a look at the system five, very short and very brief, I mean. System five, as I told you, was the older one. Now, no new system uses system five, at least on the major distros. And there are some distros which hate system D and kept using system five, but not the major ones. It was an older one, easier one to understand. You had all the control. There were some files in etc init D and there were different files. For example, httpd would start, stop, status, restart, reload or anything the httpd service and if you looked into this file it was a normal general bash script <coughs> i spoke a lot nowadays that directory is still there cd etc init d but there are very very few files here practically doing nothing Get read me. Here is the explanation of what is going on. If you are looking for the traditional init scripts, we are not using them. We are systemd based OS and whatever. So we had some small files here, bash scripts. They were checking their parameter, starting something, stopping something, and this kind of stuff. On the next chapter, we will speak a little bit more about the uh, run levels which partly again we will speak about the system five hope you liked it sorry it was long but it was important and as i told you you have a better understanding of the system d than most of the veteran system admins because they have never studied this and they still hate system d i do hey it is a strong word but anyway next chapter I was Judy. This was Judy. Whatever. Subscribe. Tell your friends. <laughs>